Hi guys, we're back again with our as yet unnamed Magento Security Podcast. I'll come up with a name, don't worry. Today we tie up the little adventure we set out on last week. Just as a quick recap, we had a problem. We established up-to-date encryption protocols and certificates for a production website, but we also have a development QA and possibly UAT versions of the same site, and none of these are using HTTPS. Since we hired the best QA resources, they insist on testing the site using the same encryption protocols that the production site uses before they sign off on any changes that go live. We didn't want to buy certificates for all the testing domains, and we didn't want to deal with the 90-day limitation from Let's Encrypt. So instead, we gave every server a self-signed certificate and made them all use HTTPS. This made our Maverick QA team happy, but when they had to accept the browser warnings of self-signed certificates every single time, they started to get angry. Okay, maybe not that angry, better. To ease tensions, we've created a protected internal server and we use the open SSL command to make this machine our very own certificate authority. With this machine, we then created a root key and certificate. The root key is used to sign all the sites we use for testing and the root certificate is installed on everyone's computer so that they can automatically trust anything signed by our very own certificate authority. From here, we can easily sign any certificates we want on our testing servers. I'm sure you guys can figure out how to include this in your provisioning workflow if you have one. And with that done, this solves all our problems we set out to conquer. Testing using the same encryption protocols as production and minimal hassle for our team. All good, right? No. <laughs> there are a few existing problems which we still have to work through. What if, for any number of reasons, we need to stop trusting a server? We need to be able to tell our entire QA team that the server certificate that we signed for that server is no longer valid. Historically, we've managed this by having the root certificate also include a URL for its certificate revocation list or CRL. The browsers can check this list whenever they want to be sure that a certificate is still valid. The certificate revocation list is just a signed binary that contains all the certificates that a certificate authority has revoked. Usually CRLs expire every 30 days and need to be regenerated, but the, its implementation was a bit bulky since every single time you wanted to check to see if a certificate was revoked, you'd have to download the entire list and decrypt it, pass it, and then grep for one certificate. This quickly turned into a mess with some browsers not checking their revocation list every time, and even worse, not checking the revocation list for the entire chain. Remember, we have a chain of trust and we need to check the revocation list for the entire chain. As a quick aside, there's something called an intermediate certificate in this chain of trust, and I haven't covered it until now. If you've encountered it and you want me to explain it in a future episode, just leave a comment below. Anyway, back to our problems with revocation lists. We also have to deal with scalability because revocation lists grow indefinitely. Some have grown to be multiple megabytes in size. To complicate things even further, some certificate authorities decided to post their revocation list in a custom encrypted text format instead of the standard binary format, meaning only some browsers and some operating systems could understand the weird ones. And as I said, it's, it's a mess and we're moving away from it. Just understand that certificate revocation lists are being phased out and you don't need them. Firefox has already deprecated them a few years ago. It's replaced them with a more powerful mechanism called the Online Certificate Status Protocol, or OCSP. OCSP is the next logical step. It's similar to an HTTP GET request, where the browser sends a request to the CA asking, is this certificate still okay? And the CA responds with a signed yes, no, allowing the browser to make a decision whether to move on or not. To achieve this, we need some sort of web app which will accept requests and return the appropriate results. These are called OCSP responders. Luckily, one comes built in with OpenSSL. I told you, OpenSSL is a wonderful thing. However, remember that the OCSP responder from OpenSSL is meant only for development and testing purposes. I'm going to skip over the actual implementation and launching of the server. It's easy and I want to have less mocking about in the terminal today. My blog post, link below, contains all the details for setting this up in your own team. Really, it isn't that complicated. But let's talk about production servers for one minute. One thing that's probably painfully obvious to all of us in e-commerce is that if browsers were to use OCSP on a live site, 
we're just going to DDoS our certificate authority on Black Friday. Shopper is triggering these requests for validation hundreds of times a minute is not a good solution. Even worse, since the customer's ability to connect to our site is directly impacted by the certificate authority being up, there's no way you could convince your high traffic site owner to use OCSP. There's a solution for this too. It's called OCSP stapling, and it requires us to take on the responsibility of proving our certificate is still valid. We do so by frequently executing the OCSP request on behalf of the customer. We then cache that timestamped OCSP response and attach it or staple it every time we initiate an encrypted session with a browser. The browser uses its chain of trust to verify that the certificate authority recently signed the OCSP staple data that it's got. Now they're sure that this certificate is not revoked and they accept our certificate. Newer evolutions of this allow you to staple OCSP responses for your entire chain of trust to your certificate. And enabling this on your production servers is relatively simple. The most important thing is you should be able to make regular outbound calls from your server to the certificate authority to get the OCSP data. And beyond that, you just need to configure either Apache or Nginx and make sure that your cache location, which your server uses to store the OCSP data is outside of your server root. With a quick restart, your server certificates will now come with a time verification that they're still valid. You're probably wondering, is this really important for my site? It comes down to this. If a customer's browser wants to verify that your site certificate has not been revoked, which is well within its right, and you don't have OCSP stapling enabled, then it will need to make this OCSP request for itself, and it'll have to wait for your certificate authority to acknowledge that your certificate has not been revoked. I'm not saying it will significantly improve the speed of your site, but do you really want to rely on a third party's server to be up so a browser could do an extra request to verify that it should be connecting to your site? Or would you rather take that responsibility for yourself? Okay, there we go. In the last episode and in this, we delved into a system that will give your internal team confidence in signing off on your site to be delivered via TLS and also to give you confidence in any mitigation processes that exist within the system. We also looked at how some of these also translate into the real world for production sites. I've followed this process and implemented it a couple times and it has gone off without a hitch. Okay, minor hitches. I'm tempted in the next implementation to not even tell QA that we're installing root certificates in their machines. The hardest part actually is convincing Brass to spend time and money on implementation of this. But the first bug that sneaks through because of an encryption protocol mismatch, you'll have permission to make it work. And when that time comes, you'll have all the gritty details for setting it up in my blog post linked in the description. In the next episode, we finally dig into some Magento and we're gonna see how all of this works with an SSL offloader. Talk to you guys next week. Bye.